to Municipal Affairs, the show dedicated to delving deep into the matters that shape municipalities. Now, as we bid farewell to 2023, we're taking stock of the highs and lows and the similarities, if you will, of municipalities in the country of Australia with the country of Canada. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with Local News Roundup and VLGA Connect host, Chris Eddy. In today's episode, we'll be talking about the similarities between our two great countries and how municipalities have fared over the last 12 months in Australia. So stay with us as this is Municipal Affairs Year in Review. Chris, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Um, as an avid listener of all of your shows from VLGA Connect and the local news roundup from Australia, um, I, I want to start with a look back, if that's okay. And in your words, as someone who is as passionate about municipal politics as I am and local government politics as I am, in your words, how was a local government in Victoria for 2023 and in the broader sense, Australia? Well, uh, thanks, Chris, um, and, and thanks for the opportunity to chat. I, I think uh, it, it was a fairly tumultuous year, to be honest. It was that for Victoria, that third year in a four-year council term where things just seemed to start to bubble up to the surface and we've seen a couple of councils in particular dealing with some serious cultural issues culminating this week with one being suspended the, the second council this year to have a serious form of ministerial intervention but we've had a number that have had monitors uh, installed to observe and advise on governance issues so that's really taken a lot of the attention and just the whole culture issue. Earlier in the year, Chris, the, the government called for input on a cultural review, uh, which resulted in an insights report, which which raised a whole range of issues around relationships between elected members and officials, um, relationships within elected member groups, um, lots of angst uh, in the community bubbling up into um, some fairly, fairly serious uh, council meeting disruptions, which I know is not a Victorian problem. It's happened globally, but really those issues have, uh, I guess, taken the the main focus away uh, in some ways from councils trying to get on and do the business that they were put there to do, which is make decisions and serve the community. So one of the things that I've noticed uh, on your show is you, you keep a running sort of tally and a jokingly running tally on the resignations and the departures of councillors and mayors across the uh, across the sort of state, if you will. Um, yeah. In Alberta, we're seeing a high demand right now of people, well, not a high demand, but a high departure rate. Uh, we, As of recording this on December 5th, December 6th in Australia, we have had 63 resignations just in the province alone of Alberta. And this is the highest it's been in the last two terms. Now, whenever I listen to VLGA Connect, it seems like you are going through, through the same pattern. Is there an understanding of why you're seeing such a high departure rate at the local level? Uh, it's sort of. It's it's a bit hard to pin some of the reasons down, uh, Chris. We've had in Victoria with 70, it'd be interesting to know what sort of number of councils and council laws we're comparing here, but we've got 79 councils in Victoria. Uh, three are current, well, four as of this week are, are under administration. So they have a small number of administrators and not councillors, but the average number of councillors per council is between seven and 11 pretty much. We've had 57 uh, countback or by-election processes since the start of the term. So that's over three years. Now, I thought, Chris, that was a lot. It felt like a lot compared to previous terms. But I spoke to the electoral commissioner in Victoria about that for the LGA Connect a couple of weeks ago. And he said, while it's slightly more, it's not actually that much more than previous terms. What I think, Chris, is that the reasons for those councillors resigning perhaps are what has changed. A lot of them, particularly um, female councillors, are pointing to cultural issues, uh, gender bias issues, toxicity in the workplace, if we can call it that, and also uh, an increasing 
uh, feeling that the workload is, uh, is is too much or more than perhaps that they bargained for when they first put their hand up to run for council. So I'm not sure whether those reasons gel with what you're hearing over there in Canada about uh, elected members deciding to resign. They are, but they aren't. So what we're hearing from what I'm when I'm hearing from sort of the exit interviews that I sort of randomly message people on social media is family obligations have become something that they weren't expecting prior to getting elected. Uh, the the role of a councillor or a mayor has was much more time consuming than they originally anticipated because they expected that it was just going to be a three hour meeting every two weeks or every week. And it really is a full time job. The reason I asked that question to follow up on the first question is because you talk about the culture, uh, the, the sort of the review of the culture around local governance in, in the, the state of Victoria. Um, do you mind me asking how the review is going? Are you seeing a change? Are you seeing the state government trying to come in and help local governance uh, address these cultural changes uh, and people sort of not wanting to? Or, or is there a big change locally that they want to have that culture change? So uh, it, it's sort of yes and no. So originally, <laughs> it, originally, as a result of that that whole process, it sort of felt like the government was leaving it up to the sector to come up with ways to address the issues. And of course, it's very hard to get agreement. Uh, a lot of elected members um, resented suggestions that were coming from the professional peak bodies about more sanctions for misbehaving councillors, etc. And there's a fair narrative there about you know you know the 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 minority um, behaving in a bad way, but the majority sort of being tarred with that that brush, if you get my meaning. But to cut cut what's been a fairly long story short, the local government minister in Victoria, as recently as about two weeks ago, as we record this, has has come out and said there will be changes made to the legislation next year to call councillors to account or hold them to account more for behaviour, particularly individual councillors that are dragging down the rest, if you like. So up until this point, the minister, um, unlike your municipal minister in uh, Alberta, as I see this week, um, hasn't had the power to deal with individual councillors. Uh, basically, uh, it's removed the whole council or put other sort of governance uh, monitoring arrangements in place. What she said, Melissa Horn, is that these changes will give her some powers or whoever the minister is to, to extract, if you like, um, councillors that have been proven to be behaving badly with, with, with um, you know, all of those processes having run through to prove that that matter, uh, being able to be extracised, or uh, that's not the right word, what's the word, excised um, <laughs> from, uh, from a council so that you don't throw the whole council out because of the actions of one or two. So that's been welcomed as a sensible change. Of course, we're yet to see the detail. We'll have something to look at, I believe, around February and a consultation process with a view to legislation being introduced in the Victorian Parliament next March. In Alberta, particularly, and even across Canada, I'm, I'm seeing the introduction and the appointment of a lot of administrators uh, municipally. When I when I listen to you, Tony and Julie, uh, sort of do your Friday morning roundups, I often hear that another council is under administrative control in Victoria. It begs the question: What is going on? <laughs> like. Is it is the state of local governments that bad where the, the state is coming in and saying, OK, we need to do something? And I know you're saying it's possibly only one councillor or one mayor and you sort of have to do away with all to because that's the way the, the rules and the legislation is working. Is that what just it is or is there an overarching theme right now where good governance and sort of bad governance is at a crossroads in Australia? I think it is at a bit of a crossroads, but but I don't think the whole system is broken. Again, I, I think it's the actions of a of a minority that are uh, tainting the whole sector, and 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 some of these get to a point where the pressure on the minister then is such that they have to take some sort of action, uh, intervene in some way. There's two elements to this, Chris, that I think are important to point out. Um, we've had I think ten 
uh, monitors appointed over a, a, a period of time. They are um, they're described as proactive measures, in some cases at the request of the council to help them deal with some governance issues. Perhaps if the cohort of councillors um, don't necessarily have the the skills or are at a crossroads on how to deal with governance issues. So those monitors observe, they they provide reports to the minister, they make recommendations. It doesn't always lead to a council being placed under administration. What we do have are four councils currently that are under administration, meaning the councillors have been removed. So two of the two of the biggest, uh, Casey and Whittlesea, for very well documented reasons, had their councillors removed prior to the last election, and they go back to uh, elected members next October. Earlier this year, one of the most serious ones was Moira Shire, where there was a commission of inquiry looking into a whole range of cultural issues. Someone actually died as uh, as a result of issues that were um, uh, canvassed in that uh, report from an OHS point of view. They made some pretty serious um, accusations and observations of how the council had been run over a period of time. And the minister stepped in, removed the entire council and replaced it with a panel of administrators. And then as of this week, we've had Strathbogie. Um, interesting choice of language from the minister, suspended until next October. Basically, those councillors have been dismissed and an, an administrator put in for an interim term with a further announcement. Um, so there's there's the serious level of, uh, re of removing the councillors, replacing them with administrators for currently, um, but, a, but a handful more that have had monitors in place to try and proactively deal with with issues, but as I said before, the 79 councils, so it's still a minority that we're dealing with. The vast majority are functioning well. They all have some issues, of course, that play out in the media, but functioning well, and they have good CEO councillor uh, dynamics uh, in place, and they're making good decisions and delivering for their communities. It's just a shame that when it does get to the point that it has, for example, with Strathbogie, that it sort of paints the sector as a whole in a poor light. And it gives those critics of the sector something else to bang on about, to be honest, which is unfortunate. We talk about the, the political side of what's going on at the council, but let's talk about the sort of the municipalities, the cities, the towns, if you will, if, if you, for a few seconds here. What are the big issues facing cities and communities across Victoria today? Because uh, with the day this airs is the exact same day that our interview with uh, Glenn Iyer, councillor, now councillor, uh, Jim McGee is coming out. And in our conversations that we had, infrastructure is top in his community, housing is top, and the affordability crisis. Is that what you're hearing when you have your local leaders conversations with uh, Victoria's uh, local leaders? Yeah, absolutely. That's pretty much it. There's a whole range of issues because, of course, local government does a lot of things. Uh, you know, it, how, it doesn't matter how you count them. It's generally going to be 100 or more different sort of services that a typical council delivers. But housing's right up the top. Um, planning pressures, uh, infrastructure pressures, growing communities that don't have the infrastructure they need. And and, and I guess uh, the overlay of government intervention, because we've had a major housing and planning reform statement in Victoria uh, that is designed to uh, allegedly uh, increase the supply of housing over a shorter period of time. Um, councils have been, uh, many have said, unfairly blamed in this space for the lack of progress on delivering housing. Councils say uh, that they're approving the permits uh, but the sector, the building sector is not following through because of the economic challenges, uh, largely. So housing, um, the financial situation, I'm sure Jim's talked at length with you about that. He's been one of the leading voices in the sector about a need to really rethink the financial model. Victoria is not the only one dealing with the financial challenges. Uh, New South Wales, the rate peg system there has undergone some significant changes recently in the way that that is calculated and a lot of New South Wales councils are talking about major rate increases if they get approval we're talking you know 50 something percent for some over two and three years which is which is a massive increase and Chris as you would know as you are also a keen observer of local government worldwide this is playing out in the UK as well with councils there declaring effective bankruptcy um, so really something needs to be done to uh, to rethink and and uh, take a fresh look at how local government is funded. 
one of the big things that I hear when I speak to municipal leaders in Alberta is municipalities, local government is the child of the province. So in your state, in case it would be the state, do you get that yeah. sense in uh, Victoria that municipal local government feels like they're sort of the children of the state and they are dictated by what the state wants at the, any given time and they are sort of left up to the state's will? Yeah, I often I use the term creature of the state. Uh, we <laughs> only exist in Victoria as by virtue of state legislation. And it's the same in most uh, states. There's no federal uh, constitutional recognition of local government as a level of government. So we are beholden to state legislation. And, and what we've seen, uh, if I use the Victorian example, Chris, is uh, new legislation a few years back, 2020, which was said to be principles-based and less prescriptive. It's a bit of a cycle. So the the old act had gotten so prescriptive over a, a lot of years with lots of changes. And then uh, we saw the Operation Sandon report, which responded to some pretty serious planning-related issues at the city of Casey. A lot of that's being dealt with with these planning reforms recently announced by the government, which I think it's fair to say is pushing the dial a bit back a, a bit more towards prescription from the state, but ab absolutely, uh, the state holds the reins. Uh, it's imposed the rate cap. It uh, it it passes the legislation. Um, we have a local government minister that has powers to obviously intervene, as she has done in recent times with 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 some councils. I don't see that changing anytime soon. Do you see the federal government intervening any time to sort of help municipalities out? Because right now we're seeing in Canada a big jurisdictional battle between the provinces and the federal government on who is going to help municipalities more. And it seems like the municipalities are, and I, I sort of spoke with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, President Scott Pierce on this. And I said, are you feeling like a, a child stuck between two arguing parents in in Australia? Do municipalities feel like they're being tugged in two different directions when the federal government is trying to help them as well? Um, no, I wouldn't categorize it quite that way. Um, or so that's a Canadian thing, that way, then. I would say it, it, it could be. I, I think um, it's been always been pretty clear that the main uh, parent is is the state government. Having said that, we do see uh, the federal government providing funding, particularly around roads and some infrastructure directly to councils uh, through some particular programs. And we have seen, I think, under this current federal government, um, more progress in recognising the challenges that councils have and a very major statement on uh, roads funding just a couple of weeks ago, which we'll see it increase from something like half a billion to a full billion dollars per year. And that's largely a response to the natural disasters that have really damaged the road network across Australia and uh, some independent research that that called for a minimum $1 billion annually to be invested into the roads from the federal government. So, so I don't think it's quite the same as you've described in Canada, but for most states uh, at the moment, they're the same political colour, if you get my meaning, as the current federal government as well. And that sometimes leads to a smoother path. Uh, let's see what happens if some of those uh, colours change at the political level in future. Um, I, I wanted to, my last sort of question here is about 2024. We're ending 2023 here. What are you looking for? What what advancements in the local government arena are you looking at in 2024 for municipalities across Victoria or even for the Minister of Local Government to sort of achieve in 2024? What stories are you going to be watching out for? So look, I'll be I'll be looking for everything that happens, obviously, as as usual. But uh, next year is an election year for councils in Victoria, so that's very much going to be a focus. You can already feel councillors and councillors uh, gearing up, if you like, for what is the most political time in the cycle as we move towards elections, which are in October. We have fixed dates for elections in Victoria. Um, March is elections in Queensland, one of our other big uh, eastern seaboard states. Uh, they operate a little bit differently to Victoria, so I'm sort of keen to watch that process play out. They have more directly elected mayors there, uh, for example, than we do in Victoria. Uh, the conduct reforms that I was talking about that the Victorian minister has announced coming through in February, March, are going to be a very interesting one to watch. Will they actually make a difference? Will they be substantive? 
Um, some are a bit sceptical about that. I, I think they might actually be more substantial than people um, uh, are, are expecting, uh, which will probably be a good thing. And of course, that has to be played out and brought in in time for the next elections. Uh, the ministers talked about more training. I think, Chris, one of the big issues we've had with councillors, particularly in Victoria, is those, a small subset of them getting elected without really understanding the role that they're putting their hand up for. And I think better training and awareness of what local government does, what the actual role of the councillor is in that process is vital. And we're sort of hoping to see that play out over the next few months as well. So I'm going to sort of poke the bear a little bit here, if you don't mind. And I'm going to ask, what municipality, what local government are you going to be particularly watching when it comes to this upcoming election cycle? I, I think the two, uh, well, the, the two that have been under administration for the last, it'll be four and a bit years, uh, are obviously a, a keen watch, uh, Casey and Whittlesey, because they'll be going back to elected members in October. Some have fears that some of the councillors, if not a lot of the councillors that were dismissed a few years ago, would run again and may get elected. Again, obviously, we want to watch Strathbogie Shire very closely, only an 11 month period of suspension there. So what's likely to happen? How much significantly can we expect would change in that 11 months before they go back to uh, elections? Some of the bigger growth councils um, uh, who are waiting on the outcome of electoral representation reviews and perhaps new ward structures, many of them are having single member wards for the first time. That's going to change the whole landscape of uh, the elected um, cohort there. So they're keen things that I'll be watching. Places like Wyndham that have had uh, large numbers of candidates, I, I think, uh, don't quote me on this, I think something like 200 candidates uh, for the 11 positions across the different wards last time around, which was a massive number. Will we see that again? Um, a lot of this disruption of council meetings that's occurred, some of the right-wing extremism that's starting to be um, experienced by councils, will that influence uh, who runs and what the outcome of the elections are next year? Um, will be interesting to see. Chris, one side note there, this year there's been elections in Western Australia at the local government level. And it's been estimated that something like uh, possibly as many as 20 uh, candidates got elected while not actually being that upfront with communities about their political beliefs. And I'm talking some of these right wing views like anti-vax views, those types of um, uh, views being perhaps not obvious, uh, but then as part of a deliberate strategy, getting elected and then wanting to try and further some of those aims around the council table. Will we see that in Victoria and Queensland? That's something I'll be uh, very keen to see and observe. Sorry, you brought up a subject. I just want to ask one last question on this before I let you mm -hmm. go. Is that a concern? Because we are seeing the rise of the populist right wing movement here in Canada is particularly in Alberta. We have a movement called Take Back Alberta, which is a more right wing populist movement that is trying to take back City Hall from the sort yeah. of progressive left. And they're saying we need to bring in more right wing sort of right of center uh, legislation to bring us back to a traditional values uh, community. Are you seeing that in Australia as well? Yeah, and to answer your question, I, I think it's a concern, um, and, and others certainly do. Um, and you know, we're seeing this sort of right-wing extrem extremism starting to influence at elections across Europe as well. So, um, it's something to definitely keep an eye on. I haven't heard a lot of talk about similar sort of um, legislative responses that you've just described to the issue, but I know a lot of people are concerned about it and watching it very closely. Chris, always a pleasure. Last uh, last word for you. Uh, where can people find your three amazing shows that I am a religious listener to, that I always get my Australia news, uh, local government information from? Where can they find them? 
You're very kind. I don't know how you find how you have the time. You're churning out so much content. I try to listen to what you do too, Chris. But there's so much there. But as you say, uh, I I help the VLGA produce VLGA Connect, which is a, a channel on YouTube as well as a podcast. So those programs that are very much Victorian focused, as well as discussion on governance issues, uh, are available under the VLGA Connect title on your podcast player and on YouTube. The local government news roundup is my twice weekly news. News bulletin plus some longer form content which is more broadly Australian and uh, some overseas content you'll find that wherever you get your podcasts under the title local government news roundup and, and I, I know will... there's someone in Cal I know there's someone in <laughs> Calgary Alberta that listens to every episode pretty much just after it comes out is that you Chris I, I have no idea what you mean, but I'm telling you right now, if you ever want a good night to uh, fall asleep with three great people talking about local government in Australia, I will have the links to all of uh, Chris's shows in the show notes below, because I would highly recommend it if you're a keen interested observer of municipal politics, not only here in Canada, but around the now, world. Now, Chris, check it out. Now, now Chris, I, I think you just described us as soporific. <laughs> Is you, you put it on so you can fall asleep. Is that right? I'm not saying I fall asleep to it because like I said, I'm usually yelling at the screen, yelling at either what Tony has disagreed with you or you, uh, Tony uh -huh. and Julie disagree with talking about <laughs> saying, well, that wouldn't work in Canada. That wouldn't work in Canada. <laughs> Chris, it's always a pleasure to chat with you. And you, Chris, all the best to you and uh, have a great Christmas New Year and hopefully we can talk again next year. And that's all for our year in review episode for this 2023 We'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude for all of those who have tuned in and watched. Your support means the world to us. Remember, our mission is to bring you the most important municipal stories from across Canada and around the world. And we can't do that without you. So please keep those stories coming. Share your municipal news your concerns, and even your municipal triumphs with us. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter in our communities, and your voices are essential to that mission. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking. 